Hi, and welcome to this Lesson 7 in our series of lesson videos for novice machinists. Planning a sequence of operation is very important. It's a way to get to your goal, which is to produce a proper part. And it's what differentiates a machine operator from a good machinist. A good machinist can see ahead of time each step that's going to be required to produce that part and place them in the proper order. In other words, in an order that will ensure or at least augment your chances for success. In other words, it's not just operations. It's when those operations should be performed in relation to all the other operations. Is what you're planning on doing now going to affect something that you need to do later on the part? So let's get to our lesson seven video on how to plan a sequence of operations. And let's start in a more theoretical or philosophical way with a section that I guess we could call uh, what to look out for or maybe more importantly what to avoid. Now we're all obsessed with shape. Now I don't know if that harks back to our hunter-gatherer days, uh, who knows, but we are as humans obsessed with shape and if we pay too much attention to the shape of a part that appears on a print right at the start of our introduction to that project, well, we tend to forget the rest. So a good thing to start with when wanting to plan out a project is uh, to take a good look at the print, but to avoid looking at the shape too much at the start. Really what do you want to concentrate on when you're starting to look at a new project? Well, it's going to be the drawing header, the notes, the other indications on the drawings. Now, once you've looked at all that, well, then you can start to look at dimension lines and finally the contour and hidden lines. A good example of that, well, is heat treatment. Heat treatment doesn't really appear on a drawing and I've seen many, many students uh, miss their shots or, or not produce a part correctly because they missed the notes on heat treatment. They were too obsessed with the shape. Now, heat treatment really affects the sequence of operations of a part. If you're not aware of the heat treatment to be performed right off the bat, right at the get-go, well, the sequence that you'll start into probably won't be very good to complete the part. My second suggestion would be to establish your reference surfaces as early as possible in the fabrication process, so as early as possible in the sequence of operations. A well and accurately established reference surface will really increase the accuracy of your part. My third suggestion would be to study attentively uh, the uh, precision required for each dimension. What is each dimension's tolerance? Now, some dimensions have tighter tolerances than others on one same print and that really can change the sequence of operations because a very loose tolerance on a dimension requires usually less number, a smaller number of operations than a very tight tolerance. Usually the very tight tolerances require a lot more as far as numbers of operations are concerned. My fourth suggestion would be to avoid moving the part around unduly. If you can perform all the operations on a part uh, as it's mounted once in a machine tool, well, you really have the most accurate setup possible. The more you dismount and move a part around, the greater the chances of error are. Because there's two types of tolerances on the part, there's dimensional tolerances and there's geometric tolerances. And obviously when you move a part around, you affect the geometry of the part. A good example is lathe work. If you remove a part from a three-jaw chuck to measure it instead of measuring it in situ, and then that part that you've removed while well, you replace it in the chuck, chuck, 
it is more than likely not going to be concentric once you reinstall it. Uh, it would have been a lot smarter to plan a, a measurement in situ and to not remove the part from the chuck, but that does require some planning. My fifth suggestion has to do with human nature again, and that is that we have a tendency to push back in the fabrication or the, the machining process an operation that scares us a little or an operation that we're just not comfortable with. I call these terminal operations and a good example of that is tapping a small blind hole. Now, tapping small holes when they are through holes and not particularly deep, well, is a pretty easy operation, but tapping small holes that are blind, that don't go through the part, and especially when they have a little depth to them, well, that gets a little touchy. And, well, we can break a tap. And breaking a tap in a blind hole, well, is a lot more of a greater problem than tapping into a through hole, especially on the thin part. So what do we do? We tend to push those operations further back in the sequence when we should be thinking the opposite. If it is possible to perform these terminal operations or these dangerous to the success of the part operations, if we can do them earlier on in the process and we do screw up, well, we don't lose as much work because we haven't invested as much work into the part. And that part with the broken tap into it that I have a difficulty to get out without marring the surface or, or destroying the part, well, that part can easily become a practice part. Uh, and I don't feel too bad about it because I haven't invested a lot of time. Suggestion number six is a three-parter. And it has to do with planning to leave material on your part. First reason has to do with holding the part. Now, if you bring a part, let's say on your cutoff bandsaw, almost right down to its final dimension, right from the get-go, while well, you're removing material that you could use to hold a part. And this is true with small parts, uh, even more than large parts. Uh, when you're working on small parts, uh, cut your rough stock a little bigger than you would normally do with large parts. Uh, uh, leave a little more on. It'll give you something to hold. The second reason why you would want to plan to leave a little more on your part right up to the bitter end would be to give you a little oops protection or insurance. An example of that is if you're turning a part in the lathe and one of the ends has a shoulder on it, well, why would you turn both ends right off the bat and bring the part to its overall final dimension? Because when you turn that shoulder on the end, if you have a little oops moment and you take, let's say, five or ten thousandths off too much in the length, well, if your part is already to its final dimension, that part is scrap. If you've left a little bit on the back end for finishing, well, and you miss your shoulder by a little, well, you can resurface the end, bring your shoulder to its proper dimension, and still have a usable part that will be brought to its final dimension at the very end. The third reason that justifies leaving material on well is a real practical one, and that is heat treatment. When you're going to heat treat a part, quite often the heat treatment is going to be followed by a finishing operation. And that means that you're going to rough the part out at the start, heat treat, and then finish. Well, obviously between the roughing and the finishing, there has to be some material left on. How much material? Well, that depends on the complexity and the shape of the part, but there does have to be material left on. So, in order to uh, grind one, two, three blocks in the one, two, three block project, well, we left about 30 thou on the each dimension, so about 15 thou per end for the final grinding. And that's important. When heat treated, you have to leave material on. My seventh suggestion uh, when planning a sequence of operation is to always be aware of the shape and strength 
of the part at the point where you are at in its development. Now we know what the part looks like at the start, we know what the blank part was, but as we develop our planning we have to take into account with each operation that is passed what is left of the part. Is it still strong enough to hold in this way or in that way? And that can really affect the sequence of operations. So be aware of how the part is changing and how can it be held after all those previous operations. A good example of that point would be a stepped part to produce on the lathe. And here we have a part with one, two, three, and four steps to produce. And this is over dimension or, or excess material that we can use to hold the part. Many people would approach this in a part movement way. And we've already said we want to move the part the least possible. And what I mean by that is they'd hold the part, turn the first end, pull the part out, turn the second, pull the part out, turn the third, and finally do the same for the fourth. But that's a lot of movement. And the fact is that this part is going to be difficult to keep concentric if we do it that way. Some other people would say, okay, we're not going to move the part, we'll hold it by the excess material here, and then we'll turn our diameters, but many, many people would start with the largest diameter first, then turn the second, then the third, and finally the fourth. And that goes against the last point that I just mentioned, in that we want to maintain rigidity. You have to take into consideration how is the part's strength changing as you're machining it? And obviously if we do it in that way, well when we machine the final and smallest end, the one that's furthest away from the chuck, well we're doing it when our part is at its weakest. It would be a lot better to maintain rigidity if we held the part by the excess material, turned the smallest diameter first, then the second, then the third, and then the fourth. And in that way, we've turned each diameter when the part is at its most rigid. My eighth suggestion when planning a sequence of operations is to take into account heat treatment. Now, we've already spoken about uh, over-dimensioning a part for, for final grinding and all that. Now, what I'm talking about here is to make certain in the planning of your operations, that all the operations that need to be completed before the heat treatment are completed before the heat treatment. Things like tapping, reaming, letter punching, these secondary operations are difficult if not impossible to perform once the part has been hardened. So it's important to insert them into your sequence of operations before the heat treatment. And finally, my ninth general suggestion when planning a sequence of operations is plan the sequence of operations. You know, it's like not reading the manual before using a new machine. Planning the sequence of operations, especially for a novice machinist, is a crucial part in the development of your skills and of the part that you want to produce. So it's really worth your while and your time to do this planning. And that's what we're going to take a look at now. Here we have the detailed drawing of our positioning hammer project. As our first example, this may be a little ambitious. So what we're going to do is we're going to concentrate on the plug, or if you prefer, part number one. A quick look at the drawing tells us that this is a cylindrical part. And that's because, well, obviously it's a one-view drawing, and the two major components of the parts are indicated as diameters. And since this part is cylindrical in shape, well, we're going to be producing it on the lathe. Next thing to consider is material. And the header on the assembly drawing of this project indicates that part number one is produced in CRS, cold rolled steel. Another quick glance at the drawing tells us that most of the dimensions have one number after the decimal point. 
but that the 12 millimeter diameter has two numbers after the decimal point. That means that they won't be having the same tolerance. So let's take a look at the header on the assembly drawing to find out what those tolerances will be. So one number after the decimal point equals plus or minus uh, one half millimeter or 0.5 millimeter. And two numbers after the decimal points equals plus or minus 0.3 millimeters. If we get back to our part, we can see that we have a part that has an overall length of 19 millimeters and a major diameter uh, of 19 millimeters. So what operations do we need to complete to produce this part? Well, starting from the left-hand side of the part, we have a surfacing operation, then a chamfering operation. Then we have a diameter to turn and a shoulder to surface, followed by another turning operation, a chamfering operation, and finally a second surfacing operation. But that's not the order in which I'm going to perform these operations. That's just all the operations that need to be performed. Before I can decide the order, I should really think about what stock I want to use and how am I going to hold it in the machine. For my stock, I think I'm going to be using Kohlrold Seal. Well, I have to. That's what's in the uh, drawing header. But I'm going to choose a three-quarter of an inch cold rolled steel. Now, this project is metric, but luck would have it that three-quarters of an inch turns out to be 19.05 millimeters. And that is well within the tolerance of my 19 millimeter major diameter. So that means that I won't have to turn that diameter. That also means that I have an accurate enough part to be held in a three-quarter inch C5 collet. So with the part inserted into the C5 collet and sticking out about 15 millimeters, I'm going to surface, then turn my 12 millimeter diameter, then complete the shoulder up to the 19 millimeter diameter and chamfer that end of the part. Then I'm going to flip the part over, change over to a 12 millimeter C5 collet, surface the part to its overall length and finally produce that second chamfer. So as you can see, not that complicated, but hold on, we've missed a few details here. There's no uh, tool list that we've made up for this project and we haven't spoken about speeds and feeds or anything like that. Now this is a very simple part and you might get away with not writing things down when working on such a simple part, but you won't get away with it very long with a complex part. For parts that are more complex we need to produce a proper sequence of operations worksheet. And that's what we'll be looking at in part two of this lesson seven video. So until then, have fun, be safe, and happy machining.